thank you for joining me today for Real Estate Religion and You. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black, licensed real estate broker with Affordable Homes and Apartments in Williamsville. And I want to thank you for joining me today for Real Estate Religion and You, which airs every Wednesday right here on Time Warner Public Access TV Channel 20, 6.30 to 7 p.m. in the evening. And Saturday is from 12.30 to 1 in the afternoon. And I want to thank you for joining me today. My name is Dr. Sylvia Black. I have my master's degree in sacred theological divinity, soon to have my PhD in Bible studies, and I'm licensed to preach and ordained as a minister, and I'm licensed as a real estate broker of affordable homes and apartments. And I want to thank you for joining me today for Real Estate Religion and You, where I talk about the books that I have written and I build a show around it. And I want to thank you for joining me today. Today I'd like to talk to you about a book that I was finally able to uh, complete, and it is Your Faith Has Made You Whole. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is ready. It is on the market now. You can just go to lulu.com, and it will be available for you. Right now, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. It's available on lulu.com, and there will be a few other websites that it will also be available on. And I want to thank you for joining me today. Now today I'm talking about my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. Now the book basically is, um, it started out as a book that I was talking about in terms of brokenness. How does one overcome brokenness? How do you handle being broken? Uh, what is the cause of brokenness? And then when I read over the book, I realized that it was talking about faith issues. And I believe that faith has a lot to do with overcoming our brokenness. So, I named it, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. Okay. Now today I'd like to talk to you about that chapter that deals with brokenness, which is chapter 3. And it's entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Broken? That's what we're going to talk about today. What does it mean to be broken? Okay. Now this is chapter 3. It's so found on page 69. And it says, broken lives, broken bodies mean something to God. Whatever situation or circumstance you are in, you can overcome and come out of your brokenness. God is here, there to help us through our brokenness. He sees our value. He sees our worth. Just because you are broken today does not mean that you will be broken tomorrow or for the rest of your life. And it doesn't mean it's over. <clears throat> Excuse me, God sees our gifts and talents, and even in our brokenness, He still wants to use us for His glory. When we put our trust in Him and allow Him to mold us and scold us and shape us into the person that He wants us to be, we have the ability to become a beautiful new creature in Him. We are His children and always will be. We are created in His image and likeness. And therefore, God loves us. It's when you feel like you're down and out. That's when God can get the glory out of bringing you up and out. And I'm talking about my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. And that's available on lulu.com. That's www.lulu.com. Now, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, New King James, King James Version, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. So that's very important right there. He's saying that if my people will, uh, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Humble yourself, pray, and seek God's face. Those are the three main ingredients to one of the one of the three main ingredients to overcoming brokenness. Okay, now more than likely you have been asking God for something or been praying or seeking after God's own heart. Okay, and God is ready to move us into our next level of anointing. Okay, um, and you're broken now and placed in the fire. Why? <clears throat> well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, now, this is one way that God answers and delivers us. Uh, being broken isn't always a bad thing. Okay? Now, for example, 
a lot of times we pray and we ask God, you know, to deliver us from the situation or to bless us with something. Or, you know, more than likely it's a, we're asking Him for something. And then sometimes what happens is, you know, we begin to take matters into our own hands. Uh, we forget that the battle is not ours and it's the Lord's. Uh, and then we, you know, we subconsciously begin to fight the battle on our own as if we are suddenly have been called as God. And we forget that there is a God, that we have a God to go to and talk to, okay, and that God is still on the throne. He always has been, always will be. And, you know, when, when we get broken, I believe it has a lot to do with um, God trying to communicate with us. A lot of times when we, we, you know, we pray to God, we ask Him for something, and He answers us. And then we become busy with the items that He has blessed us with. You know, we're, we're busy enjoying the the car, the house, you know, the trinkets, um, you know, the spouse, what have you, the friends, um, you know, just the life that God has blessed us with. And then we become too busy to acknowledge God or to even spend any time with Him. And so this is what happens when we don't spend time with God, is that now God has to then break us down. Now, take for example when, you know, your children, for example, they don't listen to you they don't do what you tell them to do. So you punish them, right? You take away some of the privileges that they are afforded, which allows them to have fun. Oh, you're not going to go out in the movies this week. You're not going to go out and play with your friends. You can't use the computer. You're restricted. They are restricted from doing certain things that they were otherwise allowed to do that, that they were to, able to enjoy their life with. And so that's what happens with you and I. When God begins to break us down, then we have become restricted now. We can't enjoy the things that God has blessed us with. You know, we are now inhibited from those things. And it, when it, it sometimes it has to get to an extreme where God has to actually put us in the fire. And that's when you're on your bed of affliction. Or like with Paul, he was blinded on his way to Damascus, the road to, uh, on the road to Damascus, okay? Um, and, you know, and how many of y'all know when you lose your sight or when you lose something that's vitally important to you, something that you need, you know, it can humble you, you know. On the other hand, sometimes even when a lot of us are broken down to our lowest common denominator, some of us still don't turn to God. Can I get some help up in here? Okay. Now those of us that do turn to God, and if you don't turn to God, you can start turning to Him now. You can start asking Him for forgiveness for not turning to Him. And you can ask Him, how can you overcome your brokenness? Communicate with Him. Open up the Bible. Start reading the Bible. Get a copy of my book. <laughs> okay. And, you know, a host of things that you can do to begin on your journey to relieving yourself from being broken. Okay. Because if you're suffering as a slave to sin, which means that you are causing your own suffering to come upon you. Um, then you have to turn that around and begin to suffer as a slave to righteousness, which means we're suffering for doing what's right in the sight of God, and God is pleased with that. Either way, my brothers and sisters, we're going to suffer. A lot of people think that when you become saved, you're not going to suffer anymore. Well, that couldn't be further away from the truth. We all know that. I know that. Okay? And that's why I wrote the book. I wrote the book originally because, I, guess I, had, I don't know if I mentioned it on a previous broadcast, but I was dealing with brokenness. Um, you know, in the past, you know, things would happen to me. I, you know, people betrayed me. They used me, abused me. And I somehow overlooked it. You know, I knew that it happened to me, and I knew that I wanted to come out of it. But if I concentrated on it too hard, it would drive me crazy because at that time I couldn't do anything about it. I was sort of stuck uh, but when I came out from among them and I was put in a position where I could do something about it, I was still dealing with situations, but I had dealt, I was dealing with it on another level. Okay, and then this particular time when I was fed up with it, I had just turned around and I just asked God, I said, you know what, Lord, I said, I am tired. You know, I am fed up with dealing with the mess and the stuff and the junk, you know. And that's when I became humble. You know, I humbled myself unto the Lord and I, you know, he, I actually started writing about brokenness in this book. And then when I read it over, I realized it's a faith issue. So I started talking about faith as well as brokenness. 
Because I do believe that they're well connected. If we have faith, as small as a grain of mustard seed, we can say to that mountain, be thou removed, and that mountain will be removed for us. Now, I'm not talking about a literal mountain. You know, I'm talking about mountain of, of poverty, mountain of uh, betrayal, mountain, you know, of abuse, uh, mountain of lack, uh, mountain of restrictions, mountain of sin. We can say to these mountains, be thou removed. All we need is a little bit of faith to get started, and I believe that the more we practice our faith, the better at it they will get, the more faith we will have. And honey, if you have enough faith, you can, you know, I mean, so many supernatural, miraculous things can happen that you wouldn't even believe the power that God has, that He can allow us to exhibit right here on earth in front of other people, that they will see our angelic being, our, uh, our spiritual being, being used in a mighty and powerful way. You, you know, a lot of you, some of you, not all of you, but a lot of you, some people don't even know, not even yet, how powerful God really is and the magnanimous things that He can do with us, to us, for us, um, in the supernatural, you know. I mean, I, you know, God has, you know, saved me from death many times, okay, and it wasn't my fault that caused me to be almost, you know, you know, in my grave, stinking in my grave, it wasn't my fault. Uh, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, okay, and a couple of those times it happened when I was a child, okay, um, and I can tell you some stories about that, but it's not about me today, it's about trying to teach you how to be more faith-based and how to increase your faith. If you want to hear my testimony, then you come to my church when I start my church, and I'll let you know where that is. Um, but for now, um, you know, I'm not going to, you know, bore you with my story. I'll, you know, inject a little bit. I'll give you a little testimony here and there. But in terms of basically, I'm just letting you know my testimony just as an extension of what I'm talking about. And it's your faith has made you whole. And um, your faith can make you whole. Now, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, when he healed the different people he had mentioned, he said, your faith has made you whole. Each time he healed them, he told them that his, their faith had made them whole. Okay, um, remember the lepers, when he had healed the lepers, and the lepers, not, I think it was ten of them, remember, and le remember leprosy, the lepers, and they came back, one came back after he was healed, and he worshipped God. He bowed down to him, and he thanked him, and he praised him, and God said, well, where are the other nine? Jesus said, where are the other nine? Didn't I heal all of y'all? So he says, your faith has made you whole. Okay, but the other ones were just healed. But this one was made whole, because he came back and he worshipped God. So keep that in mind when it comes, you know, time to you trying to get something from God. Worship Him. You know, seek His face, humble yourself, and pray. Those are some of the ingredients. Okay, now if you become a haughty and you decide to handle things on your own, uh, under your brokenness, uh, then God cannot do the work in you at this time. However, the next time you are broken, you may also be put in a fire. So while you're all broken up and your situation is hot and nobody can't touch it with a 10-foot pole, God may even have to break you down all the way. Like Job, okay? Um, and now, and only now, can God now talk to you and communicate with you. Um, when Paul was blinded on his, on his road to Damascus, he fell down. And when he got up and opened up his eyes, he still couldn't see. Okay, the man became humbled. He knew. He knew the Lord because he addressed him by his name. Okay, um, and he got up and he couldn't see and he became humble. And the very people who he persecuted was instructed to help him. Now that's an irony right there. That shows an act of faith on their, on their behalf. Okay, and so Paul changed drastically. He changed dramatically. I mean, God may put you on your bed of affliction to the point where the doctors may say, Hey, there's nothing else that I can do for you. And, uh, and whatnot, and then the only thing you can do is pray, or get the elders from the church to come in and pray over you, you know, and then perhaps maybe, and then maybe a special angel will, a special messenger will come and intercede on your behalf, you know. Uh, I have a scripture in here that I like reading that is, that it has that word, those wordings in it, but we'll talk about that in another time, and now the next question is, have you been broken? Now, information is power. A lot of people think that money is power, but information is also power, too. Because information can lead to the money. Okay, now when people have your information, they have your power. Take Joseph, for example, when he blabbed his personal business to his brothers. Now they felt that they had control over him at this point, because here he is telling his personal business to them. Oh, you know, y'all gonna bow down to me. Even his father Jacob had, had uh, actually denounced it. He said, 
You mean we're gonna bow down to you? You know, they thought it quite absurd. Uh, take also um, Delilah, uh, Samson. Samson blabbed his personal business to Delilah. Okay, um, and he wondered well, how did they know the answer to it? You know, duh. Okay, now Jesus, I love using Jesus as a great example because he's the great sufferer himself. He too uh, spoke words of wisdom uh, at the Last Supper. He told that the people, somebody was going to betray him and somebody was going to deny him. Okay, and sure enough, that's exactly what happened. Now you look at these situations in the natural and you say, hey, wow, if Joseph had kept his mouth shut, he wouldn't have been sold into slavery, you know, and, um, you know, then he would have, you know, he wouldn't have been sold into slavery, okay? Uh, who knows what the series of events would have necessarily been, but we know that that possibly would not have happened. Maybe his brothers may not have hated him, okay? But the bottom line to that is, I think his brothers hated him anyway because his, uh, Joseph's father had treated him special. You know, Joseph had a, a coat, a nice coat. Hey, I'm your, I'm your son too. You know, why can't I have a coat? You know what I'm saying? So, you know, they were jealous of him and everything because of the love that Jacob gave to him. So I guess they probably felt unloved. You know, they felt victim mentality like a lot of people do. And that's the devil whispering sweet nothings into your ear, you know. Um, and then you look at uh, Samson and Delilah. Was that supposed to happen in the natural? If Samson had kept his mouth shut, uh, his hair wouldn't have been cut off and the strength would have not have been taken away from him. And they wouldn't have gouged his eyeballs out. Uh, then you look at this, the natural about Jesus. You say if Jesus had a, uh, not healed all those people that he healed, you know, then he may not have been crucified on the cross. Okay, but then you look at it in the spiritual and you say, you know, Joseph was sold into slavery. See, these are a series of events that happen along the way. A lot of times, see, what happened with Joseph, I believe, you know, in the super, in the spiritual, you know, and it doesn't say it in the Bible. But based on a lot of things that I've experienced, what happened, and especially like in my life, uh, Joseph was humbled. Now, if you look at being broken, the, the, the sign of being broken, Joseph was humbled. He was being broken. He was placed in the fire once, not once, twice. He was in jail once, went back to jail for a second time, both times for a crime he did not commit. He was betrayed by his own family the very first time. Joseph was broken. Okay, Joseph was tested, okay, by God, because God, I believe, if, you know, Hypothetically speaking, I'm, I'm speaking this, I'm not, I don't have any proof to back it up other than my own personal knowledge um, and my experience, you know, with God, okay, and, you know, the fact that I'm writing this book. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, you know, so here, you know, Joseph, you know, God was breaking Joseph down to his lowest common denominator because he wanted to test Joseph and he wanted to see if Joseph had what it takes so that he could be, if he was going to be strong enough to endure the hardship that God was placing him in. God had placed him in a fire. God had placed, he had broken him all up into pieces, and he was just all broke up. He was in jail, and the second time he was in there by himself, he had to spend how many years? 20 years, I think, until it took, it took 20 years before God was able to use Joseph again. He had took 20 years to test him. So this could be a long time for a lot of people. A lot of people don't have what it takes to endure the brokenness for this long of a period of time. You know, look how long it took for God to use Moses, 40, 40 years. Uh, it took Joseph 20 years. The man at the pool of Bethesda was by the pool for 38 years, okay? You know, and who controls time? God controls time. And I'll say to you in response to that, delayed, my sisters and brothers, but not denied, okay? Now, God was breaking Joseph down and, and you know, saying, hey, I'm going to test you. You know, looking at it from God's point of view, I'm going to test you, Joseph, and I'm going to see, you know, if you got what it takes, so that you, because you, one day you're going to be second in command over Egypt, and your brothers are going to bow down to you because that vision that I gave you, that's your destiny. You see? That is your destiny. Okay, but I gotta break you down. I gotta test you. So I'm gonna place you in the fire. And if you got what it takes, if you can handle this, if you can stay faithful throughout all of this duration here, then I'm gonna place you second in command. And you got nobody even gonna get to be able to come over you. Only Pharaoh is gonna be over you. Okay? And everybody else will be under you, beneath you. You know, and then all this, you'll be reunited with your family and you'll be able to see your father again, you know. And so this is what I believe, you know, when, when God breaks us down. So we don't necessarily always know the future, what's going to happen tomorrow, you know, but we, we know what's going on right now. So this is part of being faithful, you know, when we say, you know, our faith has made us whole, we have to trust in God and know. You know, look back on your situation, look back on your life and see how God has been working in your life in the past. And, and you can pretty much get an idea of what's going on right now. You know, a lot, see, if your mom and your daddy was vigilant, you know, 
or somebody in your family, if, if you had the money that you needed when you was growing up, they could have just went on and took you to the doctor and got it taken care of. Or you could have went and, you know, to, to this particular school and got the best education. You know, or you could have had the best clothes, you know, because they had the money. But since our parents, a lot of us are not, you know, oozing in money, you know, and, and, and we, you know, we don't have a silver spoon coming out of our mouths, or we didn't have one. You know, our parents didn't have a silver spoon coming out of their mouths. You know, so we had to uh, learn about it from, in a, from a spiritual point of view. So now God has to work his magic, but it has to look like all hell is breaking loose in order for us to get through that. It's like you got to get through the storm before you can get through the calm. You know, you have to go through the wind and the rain and the pain. And you have to go through all of this hell and high water, baby. And you don't even know are you going to come out except for by your faith. Your faith is going to let you know and going to tell you, I'm coming up out of this mess. I, this is not my, 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 this is not my destiny. Where I am is not where I'm going. Okay, because my God is stronger and he's better than any, he's taller than any tree. He's wider than any river. You know, he's bigger than you and he's bigger than me. You see, this is how we have to start speaking, you know, prophesying, you know, over our God. Okay, we have to start talking faith-based issues. We have to just start speaking, you know, about this. We have to start praising our Lord. And we have to say, Lord God, I know you did it before. You're going to do it again. You know what I mean? All hell is breaking loose right now, but I know that I'm coming out of this. Because God's going to show me the way. You know, and we have to humble ourselves, pray, and seek his face. And then God will find its fit at some point, like he did with Joseph. So now with, with the story with, um, with, with, with Samson. Now what happened with Samson? Samson blamed his personal business to Delilah. See, he let his flesh get in the way. Okay, he had a hole in his heart because of what happened with his previous wife. And he let his flesh get in the way. So now, okay, they took away his strength. This is his brokenness. He's being broken down. Okay, he's being broken down. He's, and he's all in the fire. He's all broke up. You know what I mean? Ain't nobody want to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Okay? But Samson has one final victory. Okay? And he asked them to place him up against the pillars that, that supported the building. And he pushed those pillars down. And he had killed more Philistines in that one act than he did the entire, his entire lifetime. Okay? Now, that was his victory. He had another victory. Okay? That's when he humbled himself and trusted in God at that point. Okay, he was haughty. He was letting his flesh get in the way. He wanted what he saw. Okay, he wasn't thinking about what was up here or in his heart. You see, so that got the best of him and that caused his demise. Okay, so you got to, you got to know these things. Okay, now with Jesus, we know that Jesus was supposed to die on the cross for the redemption of our sins. And I remember uh, somebody had said, or you know, or when Jesus was facing the king, the one who controlled the destiny that said, you know, free, free Jesus and crucify Barabbas, or free Barabbas and crucify Jesus. He was the one that would have been able to say that. But he let the people decide because he washed his hands because he didn't want the blood on his hands. And he, had, and, and he looked at Jesus. Jesus says, he looked at Jesus. He knew Jesus didn't do nothing wrong. And he looked at him. He says, you know, um, you know what? Do you know that I have the power? over life and death, whether to crucify you or not, or set you free. And this is one word, so one sentence that Jesus says to this man, or that I would love to, for him to have said, that I would have said, you know, whatever, is that you don't have no power over me, only what my God gives you. Okay, and that's what we need to say out of our mouths. When somebody says something to us, oh, you ain't never going to be nothing, you're going to be just like your mama. Well, you don't have no control over me. You only have, you can only do to me what God allows you to do to me. Okay? Oh, you go, you, go, you ain't got no money. You, how you gonna do this? How you gonna do that? Oh, look at you. You a janitor. You cleaning out toilets. Oh, look at you working minimum wage. You go, you ain't got nothing now. You ain't gonna never have nothing. No, you don't have no power over me. You can only do to me what God allows you to do to me. And right now, I cast you out. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Okay? See, this is all part of being broken, and I'm talking about my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole, and this is available on Lulu.com, and I'm Dr. Sylvia Black, and I want to thank you for joining me. And also on Lulu.com, and, um, okay, I'll tell you, this chapter three that we're dealing with right now, and we're talking about, you know, what does it mean to be broken? 
Um, I talk about take responsibility for your actions. Uh, don't blame somebody else for the stuff that you do. Um, God gives us according to our ability. You know how the, talk, the story of the talents in the, in the book of Matthew. Um, you know, and then I talked about Joseph sold in slavery, Judas betraying Jesus, and Delilah betraying Samson. And then Joseph made, being made ruler over Egypt. And then was this supposed to happen in the natural or was it supposed to happen in the spiritual? You know, comparing the two together. You know, because I believe that a lot of times God has to bring about a series of events in the natural so that things can go down in the spiritual. Um, like I said, if, you know, if our mamas and daddies were righteous and if they did the right thing and took us to the right schools, bought us the right clothes, gave us the right education, fed us the proper food and what have you, or, you know, uh, you know, to the right doctors and stuff like that, gave us the right treatments and stuff that we needed, then God, you know, his job would be a lot easier. We wouldn't have to bring about a whirlwind of events in order so that we can get, uh, you know, the desired end that we need. Um, you know, and when I say that, I mean, you know, just for example, looking at Joseph, his example, he, um, you know, was sold into slavery. He had a dream, he had a vision. And I believe at some point that he knew that God wanted to use him, but he was faithful. You know, he could have advanced his career when part of his wife had, you know, tried to seduce him. You know, he, but, he, but, you know, Joseph said, no, he, uh, you know, your husband has entrusted me with all of this, you know, and I'm going to go and betray him. His loyalty was to his God, you know. And to the person who, you know, gave him the, uh, you know, the job, you know, because, I mean, you know, you needed, a man needed a job, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, he, you know, he wasn't trying to go back to prison, but he ended up going back anyway. But at that point, he was suffering as a slave to righteousness, as opposed to suffering as a slave to sin. Now, if he'd have fell for part of his wife's tricks, he would have been suffering as a slave to sin. But since he denied her, he was able to crucify his flesh. He went back to prison, he was suffering as a slave to righteousness. So God says, hey, I got to test you again. I gotta try you, I gotta see if you're really faithful. Are you really serious about that? Or were you just, you know, trying to, you know, get over? So God says, hey, I gotta test you, I gotta break you down, I gotta put you in the fire, because I gotta know if you're for me for real. If you're not for me, then you know, we'll find out in the next twenty years. But sure enough, Joseph was for real. And he was his honesty was loyalty to God. And that's the way I believe he's looking at all of us. He wants that in each one of us. So I will see you next week right here on time on the public access TV channel twenty. For real estate, religion, and you. Peace out. <clears throat> Hello, and thank you for joining me today for real estate religion. Hello, and thank you for joining me today for real estate religion, and you. Uh, my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, licensed real estate broker with affordable homes and apartments. I'm licensed to preach and ordained as a minister. I have my master's degree in sacred theological divinity. And I'd like to thank you for joining me today for Real Estate Religion and You. Where I talk about the books that I have written and I build a show around it. Today I'd like to talk to you on a continued basis of my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. And it is available on lulu.com. And this is the copy, what it looks like. It's a nice, nice, beautiful, nice little cover. That's a cover of a butterfly. Your Faith Has Made You Whole. Okay, and it's available on lulu.com, so don't forget. I, if you want a complimentary copy, please email me at sblack3001 at gmail.com, and I'll send you an e-copy uh, absolutely free. Now, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's in Chapter 4 of my book. Um, and it's entitled, It's Not a Setback, But a Setup for a Comeback. Oh, I like that. It's not a setback, but a setup for a comeback. Okay. Now, Romans 8.23, New Living Translation, talks about, And we know what God, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. And remember Joseph's vision. Joseph's vision uh, was, was, wasn't shared by his brothers, and his brothers hated him all the more because he had a vision, found in the book of Genesis. Jesus, the great sufferer also, was crucified on the cross. He was bruised for our iniquity. He was wounded for our transgressions, and by his stripes we are healed, and that's found in the book of Luke. Now, Job was challenged by the devil. I don't believe I spoke about this prior. Uh, Job was challenged by the devil. Job had already had everything taken away from him at no apparent reason, seemingly because the devil asked for the challenge of seeing if Job would curse God, if everything was taken away from him. Uh, Job did not curse God and all that he went through, 
and, and, they, and he was given double for his trouble. And Job said in the book of Job 42.10, New King James Version, And the Lord restored Job's losses. When he prayed for his friends, indeed, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So that's another ingredient that we talked about. Pray for your enemies. Okay? Now, what do these people have in common? Job, Jesus, and Joseph. Okay? Uh, now, none of them accused anyone of, you know, what had happened to them. Uh, Job didn't accuse anyone, Jesus made no accusations, and Joseph didn't accuse his brothers for what they had done for him, to him. Uh, each of these biblical characters kept their eyes on their Heavenly Father and not on their circumstances. Job prayed for his enemies, Jesus asked forgiveness for his enemies, and Joseph overlooked his enemies' actions by saying, You meant it for harm, but God meant it for good. And all these represent great acts of faith. You know, how many of y'all know that, you know, um, people do you wrong every day? You know, we're all going to be persecuted as a Christian. You know, we're going to be persecuted. We're going to, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, and we're persecuted for righteousness sake. And then therefore, you know, we have to, you know, exhibit our faith. By exhibiting great faith, we are actually, you know, pleasing God. And we're saying, you know, that, hey, this too shall pass. You know, that's my favorite saying. This too shall pass. I know that, you know, God is in control. He's on the throne. He's not dead. He's alive. And he's working inside of me and he's working inside of you. And, you know, he's not going to allow the situation to overtake me and overcome me. You know, we have to start thinking like that. And we have to know that. And we have to try to believe and not believe it all the time in what you see as being real. I mean, we know that it's real. We know that it's happening. But it's not our ultimate destiny. God is using a lot of these events, these series of events, to bring about good and brotherly love. You know, he's doing it for ultimate reasons. You know, I've asked God several times, you know, in my life, why, you know, did I have to suffer? Um, and um, one of my books will be, is, a, is actually a biography of my life, um, which I start, that was the first book that I wrote, but I'll probably come out with it a little later. Um, and I had asked God several times, I said, Lord, why me? Why do I have to suffer? You know, and I just kept asking him. I said, because I got to know. I got to know why. And the very first time he asked me, answered me, he said, um, because um, you wouldn't have known me. And I thought to myself, I said, that's pretty selfish, you know, for, you know, well, I wouldn't have known you to put me through all this hell and high water just to know you, you know. And then he said, the second time he answered me, he said, um, what good would it have been for you to have gained the whole world and lose your own soul? And then I thought about that. I said, you know what? You know, if I hadn't known God, you know, I would have been dead in my grave by now. Because God saved me from death many times. If I hadn't known God, if I wasn't dead, I'd have been conformed to the ways of the enemy. And I would still be dead, <laughs> you know. I wouldn't be, you know, around, you know. Because I would have been sinning. And, you know, God don't keep sinners around too long. You know, if you're a sinner, you know, you don't stay around too long. Maybe 20 years or whatever. You might be able to enjoy your fame and your fortune and your mischief and what have you. But after that, it's maybe, it's, as it says in the Bible, it says the wicked, you know, shall, you know, be as not. You know, they shall, you know, vanish. They, it'll be as if they weren't even here. You know, nobody's going to really remember them for very long. Um, but, you know, there is a way that you can turn away from your wicked ways. You don't have to die in your sin. You can repent and ask God to forgive you. Um, but we're talking about, you know, faith. You know, and I'd ask God, I said, why? You know, I had to know. I knew that the only one that I could turn to to find the answer was God. You know, and I knew. I said, you know, because when I finally came up out of that situation that I was in that was holding me back, I said, I'm going to give God one more chance, and I'm going to look, at, look for my answers in the Bible. If I can't find them there, then I'm going to do what I want to do. And sure enough, I found my answers in the Bible. I found everything everything that you need to know, any answer that you need to know is in the Bible. Or you can uh, get a copy of this if you just want to know specifically about this particular topic, about brokenness and faith. If you want to deal with these uh, top topics and these subjects here. You know, because I have discovered a lot of things about God from my personal experience. Okay, now these personal characters they had now in Matthew 16, 18, 19, New Living Translation, it says, Now I say to you uh, that you are Peter, which means rock, 
And upon this rock I shall build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it, prevail upon it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. In 1 Peter uh, 1, 13, 17, 1, 13 to 17 New Living Translation, the Bible speaks about hope of eternal life and our Heavenly Father inheritance, as well as a call to holy living. So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you to, is holy, for the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy. Okay, now all three of these biblical characters was, was set up for a comeback. Joseph's comeback went from a two-time criminal to second in charge of Egypt. Uh, Jesus' comeback went from death to resurrection. Uh, Job's comeback went from sickness to double for his trouble. Our comeback can be whatever we're asking God for if we have faith enough as small as a grain of mustard seed. Okay, uh, now when in the natural it looked like all hell was breaking loose, like I said earlier, but God was setting you in a setup for a comeback. Okay, when it looks like you're experiencing a setback, like a loss of job, your bills piling up, your marriage being dissolved, or you're arguing, or what have you, uh, it's usually not a setback, but a setup for a comeback. All three of these biblical characters experienced setbacks, but all of them also experienced a comeback. And that was much greater than the setback. When I mean, we can take a lesson from these biblical characters, God offers us promise for restoration. He offers hope for um, the Lord's people. In the book of Isaiah uh, 10 27, it says, In that day the Lord will end the bondage of his people. He will break the yoke of slavery and lift it from our shoulders. Okay, you can also read Isaiah 9 1 through 5. In Titus 2 12 13 talks about blessed hope, uh, says that the grace of our God teaches us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in our personal age while we wait for the blessed hope of appearing of glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. This passage identifies the blessed hope as the uh, glorious appearance of Jesus Christ, our great God and Savior. The word blessed is mean happy and beneficial. Okay. Now, um, now, optimism. Some people have optimism and some people have pessimism way of thinking. Optimism is a tendency to expect the best possible outcome of the, of the uh, to dwell on the most hopeful aspect of the situation. Optimists usually feel that good things will happen in the future or that they will hope and they will dream for it will happen. But optimists don't necessarily always represent Christians. We are God's ambassadors. In 2 Corinthians, you should read 5, 1 through 17. About because we understand fearfully and responsibly to the Lord, we work hard to persuade others. But we are definitely God's ambassadors. God can make us whole again, even though we may have experienced being broken down to our lowest possible common denominator. And I'm talking about my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. Available on Lulu.com. Okay, God can make us whole again. In Job 33, 14 to 30, this is the scripture that I talked about last week. About uh, It says, For God speaks again and again, though people do not recognize Him. He speaks in dreams and visions of the night. Uh, when deep sleep falls on people as they lie in their beds, He whispers in their ears and terrifies them with warnings. He makes, he uh, he makes them turn from doing wrong. He keeps them from pride. He protects them from the grave, but from crossing over the river of death. Or God disciplines people with pain on their sick beds, with ceaseless aching in their bones. They lose their appetite for even the most delicious food. Their flesh wastes away and their bones stick out. They are at death's door and the angels of death wait for them. But if an angel from heaven appears, a special messenger, to intercede for a person and declare that he or she is upright, he will be gracious and say, Rescue him from the grave. 
for I have found ransom for his life. Then his body will become as healthy as a child's, firm and youthful again. When he prays to God, he will be accepted, and God will receive him with joy and restore him to good standing. He will declare to his friends, I sinned and twisted the truth, but it was not worth it. God rescued me from the grave, and now my life is filled with light. Again, that's Job 13, 33, I mean, Job 33, 14 through 30. Now that passage talks uh, and speaks a little bit about what I had spoken about in the past about, you know, he speaks to us again and again, visions of the night. He spoke to Joseph in a vision, okay? And he speaks to us with visions. He gives us ideas, you know. He gives us premonitions. We say, oh, wow, I should have done that. Or, you know, uh, so-and-so, you know, uh, 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 you know, something told me to do that, you know. A lot of times we, you know, those are the different types of way that God gives us these visions. And he speaks to us again and again. And a lot of times, like I said earlier, that, you know, we're not listening to God. We don't pay any attention to him. We ask him for what we want, you know, and then he gives it to us and then we don't pay no attention to him. I know for sure I don't want to deal with nobody who only wants me for what I can give you or only want to come around to me when you want something, you know. So why would God want you to just, you know, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you have no right coming to heaven if you don't, you know, serve me. All you do is come to me and ask me for stuff. And then when I bless you for it, then you're going to ignore me. You know, God is a jealous God. He said, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, but he speaks to us again and again in visions and dreams of the night. So he gives us an opportunity to come before him with meekness and humbleness. And a lot of times we don't do it even then. You know, when we fall asleep, when we have our deep sleep, when we go to bed at night, you know, we have nightmares and what have you about, you know, different things. Uh, but he also protects us from the grave, from crossing over the river of death. And I know he's protected me from the grave many a times. And I thank God for that. Or God disciplines us with pain in the sick beds. That's when he breaks you down to your lowest common denominator. You know, when you got to break you down and he got to put you in the fire. Now you're on your sick bed of affliction. And now what you say? You know, now do you turn to God? Now do you ask him for forgiveness or do you seek his face? Or do you humble yourself and pray? Do you ask God for what, or do you just ask him, oh, God, can you help me get well? You know, can you, can you get me off this sick bed? You know, what is it, how, what do you do? What's coming out of your mouth? You know, are you asking God to bless you? Are you asking him to save you, deliver you? Are you making a confirmation to God? Are you making a commitment to him? Are you asking him to save you of your sins? Or the only thing you're asking him for is to get you up off that bed of affliction? You know, as soon as you get up off that bed of affliction, are you right back where you started from? Are you going back to the same thing you did? I know some people say, you know, hey, I'm not going back to have no dream no more. Just deliver me from this, you know, while you're barfing your, your guts out. You know, deliver me from this, you know, oh, you know, be throwing up your guts. Ain't nothing to throw up, but you just be barfing. You know, and you get it on YouTube and whatnot. They even put an emphasis on it and you see the stuff coming out. You know, but, you know, it's like, you know, you know, you be barfing your, you know, your guts out. You be like, oh, please deliver me from this. I'll never do it again. And as soon as you get well, you be the first one at the bar. Okay, come somebody talk to me up in here, you know. And, you know, you don't already promise God. You made God a promise. So can he, can he believe you now? So what's going to happen now? You're going to get broken down even more. This time you might have to get a tube stuck down your throat. Because God's got to get a point across to you. You called on him for something. You asked him for something. And he wants to know, are you for real? He had to test Job, Joseph. He had to ask, find out if Joseph was for real, you know, by putting him on his sick bed of affliction, you know, I mean, not necessarily a sick bed, but by restricting him to a point where, as you know, he said, hey, you know, you, I'll put you in, put you in jail, put you in prison and see if you got what it takes. You know, you, you said you're loyal, you walked away, you ran away from Potiphar's wife, but I'm going to test you for real, and this is going to be the true ultimate test to see if you have what it takes to be second in charge of Egypt. Now, if he knew he was going to be second in charge of Egypt, would he have continued to do the things that he did? Or would he have done it any differently? I know that I have heard the story of Queen Elizabeth when she was a little girl. She was a brat. This is what somebody had said. And then they whispered in her ears, I think the butler or somebody, he says, you're going to be queen one day. And as soon as they whispered that to her ear, she straightened up. But see, a lot of us don't understand our destiny. We don't know for a fact. That's what faith is all about. When you have faith, you've got to believe. You can sort of create your own destiny, too, as long as it lines up with the will of God, you know, by speaking it out of your mouth. 
we don't realize the power that we have lies within our own, you know, being. We, God gives us, that's one of the most powerful things that God has given us, and that's the ability to choose. He gives us the ability to make a decision. I can choose you know, whether I serve God or not. You can choose whether you serve God or not. But knowing that your choice is going to, it could come with consequences or it could come with rewards, depending on which choice you choose. Now, if you choose to serve God, then you're going to choose rewards of righteousness. If you choose not to serve God, then you are choosing death. It would seem hard to believe that people would choose the bullet, but people do. You know, they don't see a literal gun. It's not going to necessarily be pointed at your head, but you will ultimately be opening up the door to death. Just like it says, you will be uh, death's door. <clears throat> death will be waiting for you at the door. Okay. Uh, um, and um, you know, when God speaks to us in visions of the night, now all He disciplines us for pain and our sickness, right? Um, flesh wastes away, or you get get to the point where you just get so sick. You know, that the only thing you can do, the doctor may have said they can't do nothing else for you. So what happens? So now you got to depend on God. Hopefully you'll call on him, but you don't just call on him just to make you well. You want to give your life over to him now because you don't want this to happen again. You don't want to get stuck on your sick bed of affliction. And this next time you might not come out of it. You know what I mean? It might be worse. They might not have a cure for what you, you know, you're dealing with. Okay, but an angel, a special angel, you know, comes... Uh, intercedes on our behalf and declares that we is upright and be gracious and say, rescue him from the grave. Rescue that person from the grave. I thank God I was rescued. Have you been rescued? Do you want to be rescued? Well, some of these are the ingredients to show you how to be rescued right now. Your faith has made you whole. Okay, the word of God is healing to our bodies. So that's number one right there. Okay, read the word of God. And get a copy of my book, Your Faith Has Made You Whole. <laughs> okay? Now, you know, God speaks again. It says, then, then, you know, our bodies is made youthful and healthy as a child's all over again. Okay? And then you would declare to your friends, I used to sin, but it was not worth it. My, now my life is filled with light. Okay? And so when, you know, when that happens to us, you got to realize, you know, that, you know, God is on the throne. God can, we need to speak, start speaking victorious things out of your mind. Start speaking, you know, bragging on God. You know what I mean? You may not have seen him do it yet, but just believe and have faith in your heart that he's going to do it. And just brag on him. You know, my God is bigger than your God. Right? You know, you know how you brag on, you know, your father, your mother, or whatever, or there's something that you like and you just brag on it. Or there's something of yours that you brag on. You know, you'd be so proud of the clothes that you have on. Look at, look at my shoes, honey. My shoes shine, you know. My shoes can make me jump in <clears throat> hoops. You know, I can, hit, I can get that basket. No problem with these shoes on, you know. So we got to talk about our God. You know, we got to end up, we got to talk about our situation. You know, no matter what it looks like in the natural, you know, you got to speak. Let the uh, weak say that they're strong. Let the poor say that they're rich. You know, we have to. You know, be able to declare these things, declare these things out of our mouths. Remember, God told Moses to speak to the rock, and Moses disobeyed God and hit the rock. Okay, he's not supposed to hit the rock, he's supposed to speak to it like God had instructed you to do. Okay, God said, speak to it. So that means to me that we need to speak to our situation. We can tell that mountain, get out of my way, mountain, and we can tell fear. Fear is a spirit, and therefore we can tell it to go. Okay? We can say, fear, be gone, you know. We can rebuke fear. We can rebuke sin. We can rebuke anger, you know. And we can declare. We can we can bind those negative soul ties in the name of Jesus, you know. And we can declare that, you know, we are upright. We are going to, you know, profess what it is that you want. Try to control your destiny, the, you know, the kind of job you want, where you want to go from here, you know, how, how, how much money you want to have in your pocket, you know. Uh, what kind of life do you want to live? Start declaring that out of your mouth. Talking to God about it. You know, asking Him these intimate little details that you've been afraid to talk about before in the past. And start exploring them with God and watch God as He starts to envelope it and make it happen. Okay, but it's got to be coupled with your faith, communication with God, prayer, and humbling ourselves. And a whole lot of stuff that I talked about, but a lot of the stuff that I started talking about was in this book. Now, if you're one of the sinners and you feel you need repentance, you can repent right now. It's the ABCs of salvation, I call it. A, admit that you have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Out loud. B, believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and saved your sins. Out loud. 
and see confess your sins to God, not to a stranger, because otherwise a stranger will blab your personal business, and you are not Joseph, and neither are you God. Okay? So I'm talking about my, your faith has made you whole. Now when Jesus walked the face of the earth, for all of the people that he healed, he said, your faith has made you whole. Right? He told every last one of them, your faith has made you whole. Um, so what does that suggest to me? There's a difference between being healed and being made whole. Just like the passage that I read to us suggests that, yes, there's a possibility that, you know, uh, that angel can intercede on our behalf and declare that, you know, we are upright in the sight of God. You know, and that our body is made healthful and youthful as a child. <clears throat> now it also says the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, uh, Psalms 37, 11 says, But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Okay, um, Psalms 147, 6, King James Version says, The Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth down the wicked down to the ground. And Psalms 149, 4 says, For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people, he will beautify the meek with salvation. So look at all of these benefits of being meek and humble. Okay, salvation, uh, abundance of peace, okay, and the wicked's going to be cast down, okay, so these are three benefits right here that I told you about that's, you know, for being meek and humble, and if you don't know how to be meek and humble, ask God, show you how to be meek and humble, you know, instead of being all proud and haughty all the time, acting like you got it like that with your nose up in the air, I can stink like you just don't care, okay, come on somebody talk to me. Now, meek people are modest people. They don't brag or boast about their accomplishments because their accomplishments pretty much speak for themselves. Okay, now people will see the blessings manifest. Timid people let their accomplishments speak for themselves. Meek people can be considered gentle, submissive, while arrogant people can be considered to be harsh, unyielding, and individuals. Uh, meek people often encounter people who humiliate and degrade them. Meekness has often been mistaken for weakness, but there's definitely a difference. Okay, I've learned that when you get into a position sometimes where people, you know, um, say something to you out of context, you know, it's sometimes it's best to not say a mumbling word, but then there are other times, especially, you know, you got to remember to be prayed up before you go out of the house because then we need to be able to use somebody's words. You know, if not, you know, uh, not your own words, not my words, but God's words. You know, a lot of times we have to use God's words, and we have to, you know, speak directly to the enemy to their face and let them know what time it is. You know, but a lot of times the enemy takes us there, and sometimes they do need to be put in their place, but, you know, we're not always the one necessarily supposed to be the one to do it. Now, I know sometimes it's hard to walk away from situations where people are aggravating you and everything like that, but we have to just try to remember, and if you do happen to, you know, step out of the boundaries of being saved and you know, you happen to say something to someone that you, you know, regret later, ask God for forgiveness. You know, meet, humble yourself to Him and, and, and then ask Him to forgive you of your sins. But just remember, think about it. Have you forgiven that person that offended you? You know, if you haven't forgiven them, then God's more than likely may or may not forgive you. Okay? Now we have to remember mediocrity. Now, oh yeah. Mediocrity was not something for me that I did not want to choose. Mediocrity, I was like, I'm not settling for mediocrity no more. When I had began to write this book, after I had admitted to God that I was tired and fed up with dealing with the mess and the stuff and the junk, I said, you know what, I'm not settling for nothing no more. I said, because we here as Christians, we shouldn't have to settle for nothing. Okay, we are selective in what we do and what we choose, who we choose to be with, the friends that we have, our spouse if you're not married, what have you. Um, you know, we, you know, I have a right to be selective because we, ch we serve a God who owns everything. We serve a God who is omnipotent, who is supreme, who is powerful. Okay, we, we serve a God who spoke this world into existence with the words of his mouth. We serve a God, okay, who can give us the ability to speak our existence and shape our, form our life. Okay, we, give, we serve a God who, can, who, who, who uh, controls heaven and hell. Okay, who can save, who can deliver. And who can set free? Okay, and those are just a few of the things, you know, of the God that we serve. Okay, now my God is an excellent God. Okay, God is not second class. He's not run down. My God is an excellent God. I don't want to, you know, I do want, wait a minute. I do what I can to represent God in a manner uh, that is pleasing to Him. I want to be the one that stands out in the crowd. 
I always have strived to be the best that I can be whenever, whatever I do and wherever I go, whatever I wear. Okay, I'm not making excuses because my relatives were less than perfect and they didn't strive for achieve excellence. But that doesn't have anything to do with me. Neither should it have anything to do with you. Okay, I'm not you, I'm not them. Okay, I'm a child of the Most High God. God has always given me the ability to outshine my competitor. I won't let something small keep God from moving me into my next level of anointing like unforgiveness. Okay, in one of my poems I say, I strive for perfection. I want the best of the best. I want to be on top, the one in control, the one that has the last word, the one that is dare to be just that bold. Okay, I honor God, which we all should honor God. I honor God by being the best that I can be and making the best choices that I can make so that I can move to my next level. I'm not just going to do what everybody else is doing as a result. God is going to give me uh, more strength, more ideas, more creativity, more wisdom, which causes me to stand out because I honor God. I'm called to be a cut above the rest, and so are you. Okay, I'm going to outperform and outshine my competitor, not because I'm worthy or proud, but because for the very reason of being meek and humble. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today for Real Estate, Religion, and You. And I've been talking about my book, um, Your Faith Has Made You Whole, and this is it in print, y'all. Your Faith Has Made You Whole, it's about 300 pages, about 18 or 19 chapters in it. And it's available on www.lulu.com. If you're interested in a free e-copy, just email me at sblack3001 at gmail.com, and I will send you a free e-copy. And I'll thank you for joining me, and I'd like you to join me next week right here on Time Warner Public Access TV Channel 20, Wednesdays, 6.30 to 7, and Saturdays from 12.30 to 1 in the afternoon. Holla at a sister, y'all. Peace out.